Hi, it's Justin Seltzer here on ZStatistics.com. Uh, or perhaps you're watching my YouTube channel, Z Statistics. Either way, that's cool with me. Um, this is a presentation today on categorical data and proportions testing, um, which is a, an extremely important part of statistics because if you think about it, there's only really two different types of data that you're ever dealing with, numerical and categorical. So clearly categorical data are things like uh, gender or um, ethnicity or levels of satisfaction. Um, there's all different types of categorical data too, but look, we're not going to focus on the different types. We're just going to assess how we actually test these categorical variables. Appreciating that proportions is what results when you're looking at these categorical data in aggregate. Anyway, the presentation is going to be split into two halves. And in the first, we're going to deal with uh, comparing between categorical groups. So a two-group comparison might be to test whether there's a difference between male and female, for example. And then we're going to extend that to a multiple group comparison. So a categorical variable with more than two levels. So that's the first half of the presentation. The second half, I'm actually going to create its own video. So you might have to skip into the next video to get there. Um, but we're going to deal with relative risk and odds ratios, which are very, very familiar terms when you're dealing with health data, or in fact, any data focusing on adverse outcomes or adverse events like death or injury. So without further ado, let's get to my presentation, which is the subject matter of which is to do with tennis elbow. I've called this a silent killer, which it clearly is not, but I thought that photo was hilarious. Um, and so we're essentially in this presentation going to be dealing with the risk factors associated with tennis elbow, which is an actual condition. You can actually look it up, but everything in this presentation is fictionalized, all the data that is. So first up, we're going to do a two group comparison. So we can ask ourselves, here's my question to you. Do women have a greater risk of developing tennis elbow? And so you might think, well, I, I need some data to assess whether that's the case or not. So we're going to need some kind of sample. Now, before we have a look at the sample, let's just appreciate what we do in statistics in that we always make some kind of conservative hypothesis and put it to the test. So our hypothesis here is that the proportion of women, that's P women, the proportion of women developing tennis elbow is the same as the proportion of men. And we're going to see whether our sample gives us enough evidence to reject this. Let's presume we have a sample of 200 tennis players from the United States. TE is tennis elbow, so there are 100 women and 100 men in our sample. Um, and you can see 11 women developed tennis elbow and 10 men developed tennis elbow. So you can see that from our proportion, we have women at 0.11, the proportion of women is 0.11, and the proportion of men is 0.10. So straight away, my question to you is, using this sample, do American women have a greater risk of developing tennis elbow. Your first instinct might be to say, yes, they do. Look, it's 11 versus 10. But appreciate this as a sample. And this difference between women and men could simply boil down to random variation. And I'm going to say that those proportions are so close, there's no way we're going to have enough evidence here to reject our null hypothesis. We're going to need those proportions to be significantly different for us to even bother with a statistical test, I would say. So let's have a look at Australia. Again, completely fictionalized, but you can see that for Australian tennis players, the proportion of women gets to 0.2 and the proportion of men is 0.06 who develop tennis elbow. So we've got something to work with here. There seems to be a difference in our sample. And our question is, is that difference large enough for us to infer that there's a difference in the population? So here we go. Here's our Australian sample. And I'm going to repeat that because that's really what I want drummed home is the difference in our sample big enough to infer a difference in the population? Is it so unlikely now that it could be due to random chance that we kind of have to say there's a difference at the population level? Now, I don't know how to answer that question just by looking at it, so we're going to have to use some kind of test to see whether that difference is large enough. And there's actually two different tests we can use. The first of which is a Z-test. What we need to start is just the number of women in the sample, the number of men, and we have that, the proportion of women developing tennis elbow and the proportion of men. And we also need this sample-wide proportion. So conveniently enough, the number in both of these categories is equal. So we can just 
take the average of 0.2 and 0.06. And we can plug all this information into this formula, which essentially just assesses how big the difference is between women and men developing tennis elbow. And we get this z-score of 2.943. Now that's essentially a measure of how extreme our sample is under the null hypothesis. I really want you to think about what I just said there, how extreme our sample is given the null hypothesis. Now that null hypothesis is that there's no difference between women and men, and we had a sample that had quite a big variation. Now how extreme was our sample if we presume it came from a population of equal proportions? Well, the actual magnitude of this value is not so helpful, so we developed this thing called a p-value, which you can calculate straight from this z-score. You can do it with Excel or any kind of statistical software. Usually they just give it to you if you run any kind of software with a z-test in it. Um, and what this 0 0.0032 says is that the chance of getting a sample as extreme as the one we actually got is 0 0.0032 if we assume the null hypothesis is true. So that does budge our confidence in that null hypothesis. So we can infer that there's a difference between men and women. Now let's have a look at the chi-squared test using the exact same information, but just coming at it a different way. And as we'll find out later, this is actually very useful when you have more than two categories. So very briefly, the way you'd conduct a chi-squared test is to generate these expected frequencies within each of these cells. So the black text is what we initially saw. That's our observed frequencies in each cell. And the red text is what I've calculated as what would be expected under the null hypothesis, under the hypothesis that there would be no difference between men and women. And it's relatively simple to get these values. You essentially just multiply the two marginal values together and then divide by the total. Anyway, now the chi-squared test essentially compares the observed values to the expected values under the null hypothesis. So again, it's kind of seeing how extreme our sample is if we presume the null hypothesis is true. So we're going to go 20 minus 13 squared divided by 13. And we're going to do that for each cell of this table. Now, I tend not to put too many formula into my videos, but I think this is really important because you use the chi-squared calculation everywhere in statistics. And this is, if you've not seen it before, this won't be the last time you'll see a chi-squared stat, I promise you. So here we have a chi-squared statistic of 8.664. And again, we can try to find the p-value derived from that chi-squared statistic. And it's just a little side note, unlike the z-statistic, the chi-squared statistic also has this extra feature called a the number of degrees of freedom that we need to take account of. I won't go into degrees of freedom too much, but in a two by two table, there's gonna be one degree of freedom. And in any kind of contingency table as we have here, the way you calculate the number of degrees of freedom is just by multiplying the number of columns minus one. So here's the columns minus one. So there's two columns, columns minus one is one. You multiply that by the number of rows minus one. So again, by one. So one by one is gonna be one. So the p-value for a chi-squared statistic of 8.664 is 0 0.0032. No surprise, it's exactly the same as for the z-test we just saw. So our conclusion is that there is a significant difference between the incidence of tennis elbow in men and women. Why? Because our p-value is extremely small. At any level of significance, 99%, 95%, we would be rejecting the null hypothesis. So our sample, was just too extreme to realistically hold on to that hypothesis that there was no difference in the population. Now this is a little bonus section for the two group comparison. I was kind of interested to see how big that sample difference needed to be for us to reject the null hypothesis. Because remember with that United States example, it was so close, we were like, there's no way that we could possibly reject the null hypothesis. And for our Australian example, we did reject it. So if we look at the, these plots that I've put together, you can see the green area in here is where we are not rejecting that null hypothesis. And have a look at the axes here. The bottom is male. Sorry, it might be cut off slightly. The uh, vertical axis is female. So if 20% of your female sample and 20% of your male sample have tennis elbow, then you're going to be well within this green region and you're not going to be able to reject 
that null hypothesis. So you won't, so essentially that difference is not significant. But as there becomes a difference between the male and female proportions or percentages, you're moving into this yellow and then peach and then gray territories here, each of which represents a rejection of that null hypothesis at different levels of significance. So why I put this plot together was that I was keen to see what the effect was when the proportions are low versus when the proportions are close to 50%. And in our case, we're just sort of looking at this bottom section here, this bottom fifth of this plot. So if we blow that up, you can see that where we have our two samples, there's our Australian sample with, I think, what, 6% for male and 20% for female. And here's our US sample with 10 and 11. So clearly, we knew this before we even tested it, but there's no way we're going to be able to reject from that US sample, whereas for our Australian sample, it was in that rejection region. So what's interesting about this is that when your proportion is quite small for both male and female respectively, the difference doesn't need to be as large as when the proportion is sort of closer towards 50%. Maybe that's mildly interesting, but I thought I was, I was keen enough to see how that played out. All right, so let's see now how we would make a comparison across a group that has multiple levels. So in this instance, I'm asking, does the player's grip affect the development of tennis elbow? And here's a little plot of the various grips you can have on the racket. So again, let's take a look at this particular sample. This is the Australian sample again, but instead of looking at males and females, we're ignoring gender for the moment and just looking at what hand grip they use to hold the racket. And much like, much like the method we used for the chi-squared test in the comparison between two groups, we're going to use the exact same method, but it's between three groups. So we've got to try to find these expected values for each cell, given complete independence between the hand grip and whether or not they develop tennis elbow. So again, the chi-squared value just compares the observed values versus the expected values. And when you do that, in this case, you get 2.269. And perhaps you can have a go and see if you get that same value that I did. Hopefully, I've done it correctly. Now, I'm going to give you super points if you'd seen my chi-squared statistic here. And notice that I haven't got the correct degrees of freedom. I'm not quite sure why I thought there was four degrees of freedom. Um, there's actually two degrees of freedom in this table. Um, and the quick way of doing it, remember, is the number of columns minus one times the number of rows minus one. So in this case, it's going to be 1 times 2, which is 2 degrees of freedom. So let me see if I can change that in this instance, which gives us a p-value of 0.3216. And given it's a p-value which is quite high, certainly higher than 0.05 or higher than even 0.1, we cannot infer a difference among the different hand grips. So hand grip appears to be not a significant indicator of the incidence of tennis elbow whereas gender was. Okay, so that pretty much finishes the first half of this presentation. And I'm gonna make it, the next one a separate video. So just head along to part two of this video. I'll throw up a link here, um, where we're gonna deal with relative risk and odds ratio.